back to shattering this. We haven't covered this now in a month of Sundays, uh, as uh, the preacher would say. Although um, I would, um, I would only know from ancient history, and that I haven't been inside of a church in more than a decade, and uh, don't uh, intend to. Uh, that's not quite true. Um, I did, uh, at my wife's uh, pleading. Uh, sit there uh, rumbling under my breath as my nephew was uh, married uh, because it was uh, an important family event. But other than that, I haven't been inside of a church uh, in a uh, month of Sundays. But we're going to return to questioning Paul. Um, Kirk, it's been a long time, but uh, do you recall kind of where I, I mean, I know where we were. I'm just out of curiosity. Um, uh, what topic Paul was talking about in, uh, in his first letter, that's to the uh, Galatians. Um, do you have uh, kind of an idea as to what the topic was that was high on Paul's agenda as he was writing this rebuttal to the Jerusalem Council where he was uh, taken to task for his preaching and is the fact that his preaching was so anti torah Well, we, we know this one is, is, is circumcision. That's his big circumcision. Deal. That was his big deal. If you're not circumcised, you can't do Passover, and therefore you're, you're doomed from the, from the get-go. So that, that would be where you would attack if you hated the Torah. How many uncircumcised men are part of the covenant? None. How many uncircumcised men are in heaven? Uh, none. <laughs> Does, does God give us a uh, some wiggle room, a glimmer of hope for those who are uncircumcised, that that just perhaps He might uh, acquiesce? All you know, if Christians would say He's all loving, He's all forgiving. Is there any possibility, based upon what He said, that an uncircumcised man will ever enter heaven, will ever be allowed to participate in a covenant, will ever be welcomed at Passover? There are. Five things you agree to, if you want to be part of his family, that happens to be one of them, and there is no wiggle room. No, in fact, he says then, uh, and, uh, uh, through his prophets, that the, the most despicable teaching that has been promoted by uh, Israelites, or a Israelite, doesn't specify the number, is this notion that... Uh, uncircumcised men are welcome in heaven. To my knowledge, there's really only one Jew that promoted that, because those rabbinic Jews, religious Jews, and those promoting Judaism are all advocates of, uh, of circumcision. I only know of one Jew who, uh, who conceived a religion whereby circumcision was considered um, detrimental and that uh, being uncircumcised is what uh, garnered you favor with God. Mm-hmm. The most, the most uh, quoted individual in the world, Shaul. Shaul, yeah. Paul. Oh. Oh. Absolutely. So uh, when God said that, uh, that, this, uh, that this false teaching, which said that uncircumcised men were welcome in, uh, into heaven, was the single most egregious crime that's ever been perpetrated, he was talking about Shaul Paul, founder of the Christian religion. Yeah. Now, what's also interesting here is that um, why do you think that God would say is saying that not only is there no uncircumcised man in heaven and never will be, and that the, uh, that a religion that suggests that it's possible is such an egregious crime? Why is God so opposed to the notion of an uncircumcised man in heaven? Because, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be spirits in heaven. We're not going to have bodies. So the circumcision is not a physical thing in heaven. Mm-hmm. So why is God so opposed to it, you think? Well, you, you know, he's, he's big on symbols, and, and, it's, a, and it's a symbol of uh, separation. And yes. I, and so... What is it the sign of? It's the, it's the sign of the covenant. But, I mean, it's... it's okay. How many families does God have? He has one family. How many homes does he have? He has one home. And one is, uh, is covenant uh, the Hebrew word for family and home? Yes, it is. Yeah. And so God has one home and one family. His home happens to be heaven. His family is the covenant family. He only has one home, one family. 
and the sign of that home and family, the sign that says, I am part and I want to be part of that home and family is circumcision. Mm -hmm. So if you're not circumcised, you can't be part of that uh, family and you can't be part of that home. You've, you've said, no, I don't, I don't want to be part of that family and home. So what he's saying, and, and for those who are thoughtful, those willing to make a connection, that if you're not engaged in the covenant, you can't enter his home. That's what he's saying. What he's looking for is the sign of the covenant to see if you are a member of the covenant so that you can uh, engage in his home, enter his home. If you don't have the sign of the covenant, you can't enter his family. You cannot enter heaven. That's what he's saying. Yes. Because the covenant is the prerequisite for being for entering God's home. But let's take the other approach where he says, if you're not circumcised, you can't participate in Passover. Why would he say that? Well, because uh, it's, that's the, you, because if you actually knew what you were doing in Passover, mm -hmm. Passover gives you eternal life. And eternal life would be separ eternal, eternally separated is what you would be. Right, because you're not a member of the covenant family. God's only going to save and perfect and enrich and empower his covenant children. He says so over and over again. So under that basis, if you were uncircumcised, you're not a member of the covenant, and you took place at part of Passover, you become a mortal. Mm -hmm. But a mortal forever estranged from right. God's family. And, and that's the most hein uh, heinous crime of all when you when you view it that way. You re recognize what's going on there. That's that's uh, uh, that's um, Satan's big uh, whoop to do. No, absolutely. That would be his uh, his ultimate dream. That wish. Nothing. Yeah, because that would that would cause all of humanity if they celebrated uh, what occurred on Passover, which Christians do when they uh, that's their. Their, their Easter week, and that's their Good Friday. If you celebrate what happened in you and you, uh, what happened on, on, on uh, Passover uh, through their Good Friday, and you are not circumcised and you're not a member of the covenant, you can't be saved. But you're immortal at that point. Mm -hmm. That means that your soul is off to Sheol, uh, which uh, is called hell. Uh, by uh, Christians. That's that's the consequence. Now, Christians will claim that baptism replaced circumcision. Mm -hmm. Now, what did God say about uh, circumcision? Did he say that you could ver view uh, circumcision strictly symbolically, strictly um, spiritually, or did he make a distinction and say that you have to be circumcised of the flesh and of the spirit? Mm -hmm. Both. Yeah, both. Yeah, both. 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 So this is not a, a situation. You know, there's some things in the Torah where you can read them and say, you know, that's that is spiritual uh, advice. You know, he's he's got to die. Uh, I think it's three of the animals that are listed uh, in the uh, this is not food category that uh, uh, didn't exist at the time, don't exist now. I have never existed, and so we're, he's not talking about a specific animal, but what that animal represents. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of things in the Torah that that speak of what something represents, and when you understand what it represents, that's that's really God's goal in that regard. But in the case of circumcision, he doesn't give you that option, does he? No, no, not at all. You're either circumcised of this of the spirit and the flesh, or it doesn't count. And so listen, I mean, listen, you can always walk away and say no. Right? That's right. It's not. It's not like it's a command. It commands you have to do it, whether you like it or not. Right. Not a, you're not a slave. But right. If you want to join this, this is my. This is yeah. the deal. This right. is the contract. Here's the, right. I promise this. You do this. That's right. It's uh, it's it's like when you get married. It's a there's a marriage vow in both parties, husband and wife, vow to uh, to do certain things and to expect certain things. And uh, the covenant is the same way. God uh, asks certain things of us, and he um, promises certain things. Mm -hmm. So it tells us what we can expect. And in the, uh, the covenant, you do not have to agree to any of these things. And if you don't agree to them, you're not going to hell. 
No. No punishment. You just can't be part of his family unless you agree to the uh, terms and conditions of the family. And if you do, then God is bound to provide his benefits. Mm -hmm. So you're right. You're, you're, you aren't required to be circumcised as a man. No. Unless, of course, you want to be immortal. You want to uh, be perfected. You want to uh, know who Yahweh is, you want to understand what he's offering, you want to engage in a relationship with him, you want to spend eternity in his home. If those things are true, circumcision by itself won't give you any of those things. But the lack of circumcision will preclude you from having those things. Yes, but it is. And, you know, uh, women, uh, your wife might say, for example, you know, uh, well, what is the sign for a, uh, a woman? It's the same. That's not for her to be circumcised. The instruction on the covenant uh, is that we as parents are asked to circumcise our males, our sons, our males, on the eighth day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't tell you how much to cut off. It doesn't tell you who has to do the uh, the uh, the snipping. So it's, this is not a, it's, it's very much like uh, trying to ascertain the days of the, uh, the specific days that the Moed Mikra are, uh, are to be observed on. Um, thinking people can come to very different conclusions as to how much and, uh, and, uh, and who. But God specifically does not tell us. But it's not about the how much and it's not about who does it. He says nothing about the setting. He just says that as parents, we're to circumcise our sons on the eighth day. So when a child is born, who is the primary custodian of that child when it is eight days old? Uh, the mother of primary. You betcha. So it's, you want to know what the mother's uh, sign is to, uh, to do this for her sons so that she remembers and they remember? The covenant. That's uh, so. It's uh, it is very much presented as a motherly uh, choice, the sign of the covenant, and it just happens to be the fifth condition for participating in the covenant, and it's the fifth for a reason. It says, okay, once you understand what God is offering, once you've come to know Him and choose that you want to spend eternity with Him, this is the sign. Welcome back to Shattering Mess. We're talking about the Great Divide, of course. Um, that is the, the dividing line, the fulcrum that differentiates Pauline Christianity from the Torah. And the, the, the reason that one thing was chosen is really quite ingenious, the circumcision. Um, why do you think Paul chose circumcision to be the fulcrum upon which he would move uh, in the opposite direction of God? He's involved in Greek thought, you know, that was abhorrent to them. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think he was inspired. Uh, he's, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's the only, only quote-unquote, Man of God who who has the audacity to tell everyone he's uh, <laughs> I'm possessed. Yeah, yeah right, right. He's obviously inspired. He's obviously yeah. inspired so to do what this. you've said in terms of Greek philosophy is um, is uh, I think uh, I don't know if it's fifty percent complete or eighty percent complete, but it's somewhere between the, the two. But, but that, you go into that frame, and it, and we right. find that abhorrent. Right. Right. The, the only thing that, um, that would add to why he played it that way, the, from, from the antagonist point of view versus uh, Yahweh's point of view, would be also Roman thought. How did Rome, who was Rome's at, at this time, uh, around um, uh, 70 to, uh, to 80 CE? Um, who at that time? was the most hated people in the world by Rome, whom they, the only people at, uh, that, uh, that they had fought not one but two wars against mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the 50 years prior to that time. Yeah, that was us. obviously Israel. Actually, one war prior, one war uh, would follow uh, immediately thereafter. Uh, one fought uh, 
around uh, 70 CE, the other one uh, 133 to 135 CE. So it's right in between the two wars against uh, Israel makes the point even more valid. And what was the Roman means of determining, because they, you know, there wasn't much difference in the, uh, in the way that the Persians looked, for example, and the way that they, because they, you know, Babylon and... Uh, and 300,000 of them went to Babylon, so... Yeah, right, and, uh, and of course, uh, yeah, they other came back from Babylon, and, and uh, Abraham was a Babylonian, after all, mm. and came out of Babylon, uh, so did uh, his, uh, his wife, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, so they wouldn't have looked racially any different than the Persians that they were uh, fighting uh, here and there at that time. Uh, so what, we, uh, what was the means that the Romans used to determine whether or not they were going to kill you? Uh, you betcha. So that was the sign of the enemy in Roman thought. Uh-huh. And make no mistake, the people Rome despised the most at this time, overwhelmingly, it wasn't the Visigoths, it wasn't the Gauls, but the Jews, far and away. I mean, no one anywhere close to the Jews in terms of enemies. So part of this Roman thought. Now, in Greek thought, are you familiar with the principal Greek religious and philosophical um, uh, viewpoint at, the, at this time in history, what it was called? Uh, Gnosticism? That's yes, correct. Huh? Yeah, Gnosticism uh, was uh, uh, was essentially the religion and political mantra of Socrates and Plato and uh, of uh, Aristotle, uh-huh. and it uh, held the view that that which was of the flesh or that which was worldly or material was an inferior, faulty, errant, and evil shadow of, uh, of that which was perfect. And so the spiritual was perfect and the material was flawed. Mm-hmm. So circumcision of the flesh would be uh, an act that would be evil, mm-hmm. flawed, corrupt, yeah. uh, you know, uh, a negative thing, where that which is spirit would be positive. So Paul chose to play right into Gnosticism, Greek religion and philosophy, by, by condemning that which was of the flesh. In fact, he writes in Galatians, uh, he has a whole diatribe of the flesh versus of the spirit, and the, from Paul's point of view, because the Torah insists on circumcision as the sign of the covenant, it's of the flesh, and therefore it's evil. So that means you cannot teach Matzah. That's correct. Because you cannot say walk to me, physically walk to me. Right. Right. Perfect. That is correct. So the it appealed to Romans, it appealed to Greeks, not and, and a total uh, uh, disregard, a hatred for circumcision appealed to Romans because they were their enemies, and appealed to Greeks because of Gnosticism. So it appealed to his audience. And, of course, it destroyed the relationship with Yahweh. So here we have Paul, for um, who thought, sought to be believed. And if you read Paul's first f- uh, five letters, the letters to the Galatians, both letters to the Thessalonians, both letters to the Corinthians, even Christians will acknowledge, any Christian scholar will acknowledge, yes. that Paul was... Uh, up in arms, that he was really pissed off, that in all uh, of those letters, he is condemning those that he spoke to because they turned on him. They uh, rejected what he had to say once he left, that they pretended to go along, and that Paul was was desperate to get them to reject um, their negative conclusion of him and believe that he cannot lie, that he is the apostle of God, that, that, uh, that God gave him control of the entire world, and that he alone has the means to, uh, to heaven. That when someone didn't believe him, he went berserk. His letters are really hateful and insulting of the audience in Thessalonica, Corinth, and uh, Galatia. Yes. 
And so you have him trying to appeal to the, uh, the soft spot, Gnosticism for the Greeks, uh, anti-Semitism for the Romans. So you have him trying to appeal to them, and yet even when he makes that appeal right in their soft spot, they're still rejecting him. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a reason that Paul chose circumcision and beyond the fact that it would have made him immensely more popular with Gentiles, Romans and Greeks, than had he uh, not uh, drawn his line in the sand there. Mm-hmm. Because if you oppose the Torah on the thing that is considered the most repulsive to Greeks and Romans who influence most of the world at this time. Mm-hmm. That's going to make the popular, isn't it? Well, yeah. And, but on the other side, if you oppose the Torah on the issue of circumcision, the sign, the very sign, there's only one sign of the covenant, on the sign of the covenant, and if you're working for the opposing side, you're working for the adversary, Hasatan. Mm-hmm. What, what strategy would be better than opposing the covenant on its lone sign? You couldn't come up with something better than what they did. You know, you can oppose uh, Passover and, and people simply uh, die. Mm-hmm. You can oppose matzah and, uh, and no sin is forgiven. Mm-hmm. You can oppose the, uh, the Torah's guidance and people are just lost. Mm-hmm. But if you oppose circumcision and then you celebrate on a warped way what happened on Passover with the crucifixion, and you form a religion that says your God died uh, to save you and you celebrate pass over that way, then you have all of humanity that buys into that um, damned. And it's been eternity with Satan. It's, there's nothing you could have done strategically from the adversarial point of view that would have been as damning as what Paul did, which is to preclude entrance into the covenant. Well, you know, I understand what what Paul is doing. I mean, he was a um, wannabe rabbi, at least, and uh, he understood these things. But the rabbi rabbi in him would have been in favor of circumcision. It would, but I mean, but his training would allow him to know both sides of the coin, so he would not have been ignorant of what he was doing. Oh, no, he was not ignorant. Oh, there's no question. This is not a, I just goofed, I misunderstood. Yeah. Oh, no. But oh, no. This is, this is the entire foundation of, the, of Paul's argument is that circumcision is of the flesh, therefore the Torah is of the flesh, that which is of the flesh is evil, therefore the Torah is evil. Yeah, he, he spelled this out. He spelled this out. Oh, yeah, that's, that is, that's the foundation of, of, of Pauline Christianity. And the foundation, while it appealed to the Greek mindset and to the Roman mindset, True. it was the antithesis of what God said. And as such, what do you think the, just run the odds here for me, what are the odds that somebody who is going to undermine the single most important thing that God said, his, God's very foundation, which is the sign of the covenant, that, and, and his Torah teaching, laying the foundation and the, and the guidance to his covenant family. What do you think the odds are that somebody could call that pornography, could demean it to say that, that that plan that God enabled can't save and that it enslaves when God says that it liberates? What is the likelihood that person was authorized not only to speak for God but was given the entire world? To speak for him? Yeah, you, you can't get there unless you never read, never read the, uh, uh, the um, five conditions. I mean, you, you yeah. just can't go, you can't go there from there. You either have to be ignorant of the Torah uh-huh. or, just or wholly irrational, where you, where you cannot form a reasoned conclusion based on the evidence. You're incapable of recognizing that, that when two people say exactly the opposite things, that one of the two ain't telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Now, why is it that Rome uh, hated the, the Israel so much? 
Uh, I mean, they, they, they could have, uh, uh, no. Because the Romans were, they mean, the, the Israelites yes. were the only nation that would not capitulate to Roman deity, to Roman supremacy, to uh, Roman ideals, to Roman gods, to the Roman religion. Every other subjected community, the people chose to accept the subjugation of Rome and to accept their deified status, their superior status, godlike status as men, and their Roman way to live. But the Jews were willing to say, rather than accept Roman paganism, rather than acknowledge uh, Romans as God, rather than accept Roman law, we'd rather die. That's why. Well, I mean, I, I know that's the answer. I just, um, from a Roman standpoint, it seems like they would have just done like the Muslim, just tax them extra and, and forget it. They did, uh, um, uh, yeah, what they ended up doing is that when they wouldn't do that, then they, they forced every um, Jewish male to serve in the, uh, the Roman uh, army. And, yeah, and so they took all the men away, and then they put uh, more and more legions there to, uh, to control them. And then, you know, at, at, the, at the end, um, um, it's, you know what happened. Um, the two, the two most, the two most, yeah, egregious. The only Roman um, war, more um, savage, uh, more ruthless than was the uh, um, the first uh, Roman assault on Israel, was uh, their final war against Carthage, where. You know, the Carthaginians, yeah, the Carthaginians did not do anything that was inappropriate with Rome. Rome was the antagonizer all the way through and manipulated the war because they, they wanted to uh, annihilate Carthage. So their destruction of Carthage would have been more ruthless than was and more unjustified, perhaps even, than uh, Rome's first assault on Israel in 70 C. But Rome's second assault, the Hadrian assault, on Israel, where Hadrian uh, said, well, I'm inviting all the Jews back, all these uh, Israelites back, and we're going to rebuild the, the, uh, the, the Jerusalem that, that, you know, we Romans destroyed, and we'll rebuild the temple, and you just all come back now, and this will be really good, and he lured them all back, and then he says, oh, by the way, we're, it's going to be a temple to me and a temple to Jupiter, and we're going to rename the, uh, the city after me, and, uh, and on top of all that, we're going to make this a, uh, a place where the legionnaires can come for uh, vacation. And, uh, and then he set out to slaughter them. And, um, uh, and you'd even have to say, Kirk, that when Rome in 70 used the, the, the great treasure in Yahweh's temple, to finance the construction of the Colosseum. And they used the slave labor of, from enslaved Israelites to build the Colosseum. And you have the contrast between Yahweh's home, his temple in Jerusalem, and the Colosseum in Rome, which was the single most despicable arena for human behavior in the history of mankind. Yeah, way past the Nazis. Oh, yeah, there's, there is no... There is no spectacle in all of human history that rivals the depravity of the of what took place in the Colosseum, and so you you that is the ultimate contrast between that which is of Yahweh and that which is of man, and it's why Yahweh went on to say that Rome would be the single most ruthless and vicious animal in all of human history, but that Rome would not die, that Rome would continue right through the last days. And it has, the Roman Catholic Church. So, yeah, it's, um, there was never a more overt enemy of Yahweh's chosen people than Rome. And the Babylonians for a brief while, the Assyrians for a brief while, uh, the Egyptians for a brief while, the Hittites for a brief while, the, the Philistines for a brief while were enemies of Yahweh's chosen people. And now, you know, for the last... Uh, 1,400 years, the Muslims. But no one in all of human history were as ruthless as depraved 
towards you know his chosen people than the Romans, and that's why it's just so telling that Christianity grew out of that. It's the Roman Catholic Church. Well, that makes pause to think, or it should. Yeah, what did the you know under Hadrian? What did the Romans do with those who were Hebrew scholars uh, and with the actual Torah that uh, they were uh, studying and reading from? You know, they, they wrapped them up and burned them with the Torah on them. That is correct. And, and I think they delayed the burning or with, with yeah, they they actually moistened the uh, the Torahs they that they would wrap around these people so that they would die slowly. That's how depraved the Romans were. These are the people that had the uh, crucifixion to a right. fine art. I mean, this is pretty... Yeah. Uh, Hadrian made all things Yahweh illegal. Mm-hmm. Passover was illegal. It was illegal to celebrate Mosul. It was un- illegal to be circumcised. It was un- illegal to own a copy of the Torah, to read the Torah. Torah. It was illegal to honor and observe the Shabbat. It was illegal to do anything that Yahweh asked to be done. Rome set itself out as the opposite of Yahweh. And the Roman Catholic Church grew right out of Rome. Welcome back to Shattering Myths. If there were one myth we could shatter, if I were given just the opportunity, Kirk, to say there's only, you, you want to get one shot. One shot, okay. One shot. What myth do you think that I would choose to shatter if I only had one? If there's a thousand myths out there. Which one do you think I would most like to shatter? Paul. Yeah, Paul and Christianity. Mm-hmm. Christianity, uh, based on its New Testament, half of the books written by Paul, and really 100% of the basis of Christianity being Paul. Who saved them? Who saved what? The Paul's letters. Yeah, if, was, yeah, Paul's uh, letters were, in, were, you know, were both popular and unpopular. Um, it's an interesting history. When you read his uh, third letter, I don't know if it's the second or his third letter to Titus, uh, uh, not to Titus, but Timothy. Um, he he admits to Timothy, who he has out there in Ephesus, uh, um, trying to condemn uh, the teaching of Yahweh Kahnan. So he is overtly condemning everything that Yahweh Kahnan, the disciple whom Yosha not only loved, but the disciple, not Paul, that Yosha chose to uh, to reveal revelation to. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, in fact, his birth mother, uh, Mary, was under Yahweh Kahneman's care, not Paul's. Uh, now, Paul had nothing to do with Yahweh. You know, she never met him, never did nothing to him. But, but he, Paul, because he realized that the disciples, uh, particularly Yahweh Kahneman, was his primary, most formidable foe, uh, had Timothy out there in, uh, in Ephesus to, uh, to try to undermine uh, Yahweh Kahneman. And so... Um, in that letter, he says that uh, he is all alone, that everyone has deserted him, which means I think even Luke deserted him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, he says it. He says, everyone's deserted me. I don't, have, I don't have a single friend left in the world. No one, and for him, his view wouldn't be, friendship wouldn't be, uh, in his view, somebody uh, to go off and, uh, and uh, I don't know what sports they play, but... Uh, to, you know, to go throw a javelin with. You know, they didn't go off like yes, they didn't play golf back in the day. Uh, his view of, of being abandoned means, means that everyone that he tried to influence rejected him. So his letters and his preaching had failed completely. Everyone rejected him. And it wasn't hard. And all you had to do is he was claiming to be the lone spokesperson for God, and yet the very people who were who Yosha picked and had trained to speak for him were saying the opposite of what he was saying. And he was condemning the very testimony of the God that he claimed had authorized him. So you didn't have to be the sharpest tool in the shed to figure out the guy was a con man. And, of course, his whole rhetoric was just... I mean, he contradicts himself. Any person schooled in rhetoric, which the Romans and Greeks were, anybody schooled in rhetoric would have recognized that instantly the Paul was a fraud. So he, he was completely abandoned and completely alone. So he had failed entirely. 
So what what happened? Well, how did he become the basis of Christianity? And the answer really is uh, is uh, twofold. One is a fellow named Marcion. Marcion um, was a overt Gnostic. He realized that Paul's letters uh, advanced Gnosticism. And so Marcion tried to create the, a religion of Christianity, and he had lots of money. He was a, uh, a real merchant of the day, um, shipping um, enterprise. He would have been the uh, Onassis of his day. He had put all of his money behind codifying Paul's letters as the scripture of what was essentially a Gnostic religion. And he promoted Paul and uh, came up with a codex of Paul's uh, letters. Papyrus 46 is essentially that. And then, uh, well, Marcion became extraordinarily powerful because he was the focus of this new religion. The Roman Catholic Church uh, was the trying to, uh, to earn its place, and so it uh, labeled Marcion a, a heretic, but they uh, accepted everything that Marcion had done is said and done. You know, just as the Roman Catholic Church uh, accepted Sunday worship and, and Easter and Christmas and all these other pagan ideas. And then at the Council of Nicaea, and then later under uh, both Constantine and Theodosius, the religion of Christianity was promoted on Paul's letters. He's the one. He was resurrected from the dead. I guess. We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs>